I'm Christopher Clark, Cambridge historian. I was born in Australia. For Europeans, that's practically the other end of the world. But the European continent and its incredible diversity always fascinated me. Even in the far off country where I grew up, I was always aware that so much of our world has its roots in Europe. And modern Europe is one of the greatest achievements in human history. I want to share the grand saga of this continent. And in the process, I hope to rediscover its wonders for myself. Where does Europe start and where does it stop? I'm at the southwesternmost point of the continent. From here on, there's just water. Next stop, America. Luis de Camões, the national poet of Portugal, described this cape in the 16th century in these words, aqui onde a terra se acaba e o mar começa, where the earth ends and the ocean begins. In fact, most of Europe is surrounded by water. Europe is a continent in name only. In reality, it's a peninsula, and its history is deeply shaped by this fact. That history begins 135 million years ago. Actually, Europe as we know it isn't really all that old in a geological sense. In the beginning, all the continents are one. Then the world is set in motion. Land masses break off, drift apart and reunite, creating mountains and rivers in the process. Bit by bit, the continent as we know it today begins to take shape. Ice masses form fjords, mountains unfold. The lava flows we can still see today give us an inkling of Earth's incredible power to create and reshape. And at some point, these elementary forces will produce a denser array of unique cultures and peoples than anywhere else on the planet. How did it all begin? Asia, to which this rather small continent is a kind of appendix, has always been the gateway to Europe, also for the first humans to arrive here. But who were the first Europeans, and where were they from? It's during an ice age that the first people leave Africa to conquer the rest of the world. A sheet of ice, kilometers thick, covers the continent where today we find cities like London, Berlin, and Warsaw. But Homo sapiens will not be deterred. From what we know today, it seems that they travel to the continent via the Middle East, the Levant, and Romania, and slowly it begins to grow warmer in Europe. The ice age is coming to an end. This is where the first migrants come into contact with the Neanderthals and begin to mix with them. Even today, all Europeans have a bit of Neanderthal in them. By 30,000 years ago, the Neanderthals have died out and the Homo sapiens, the wise human, has taken over. They hunt and gather, live in groups of varying sizes and spread out across massive swathes of territory, often in rocky areas with caves, such as southern France, and northern Spain. It's around this time that the intellectual world of the early Europeans actually begins to take shape. The depths of the caves are sacred places for these early peoples, prehistoric cathedrals where they feel the presence of the supernatural world. But above all, the caves offer protection and warmth, absolute necessities that allow these early Europeans to survive. Here we can see the first evidence of the ancient Europeans. I'm in the Chauvet cave in southern France and I can hardly believe that people painted something like this 30,000 years ago. The talent and precision of these early European artists are staggering. When Pablo Picasso first saw the cave paintings of Stone Age humans, he was shocked. We've learned nothing since then, he said. The people of the Ardèche Valley in modern-day France created these first European works of art nearly 40,000 years ago, and they did it for eternity, probably without realizing it. How could they know that we would one day admire the woolly rhinoceroses, cave lions, mammoths, and bison that they drew with such energy and elegance? A quantum leap in human history, Homo sapiens became a cultural being, Humans reflected on their own existence, 
observed and recorded their environment and invented a new form of communication. A bison with eight legs, like a time-lapse image. We can't know for sure, but they were probably supposed to suggest movement, a kind of Stone Age cinema. These works are among the oldest expressions of human creativity anywhere on Earth, a kind of cultural Big Bang. We have no idea what brought it about. All human societies have produced art, and there have always been moments in which something new emerged. What was special about Europe was the tension between memory and renewal, between continuity and rupture. Michelangelo may have imitated the Greeks, but he also created something new, something that had never been seen. Landscapes, objects, and people came to be seen in new ways. Art rebelled against tradition without escaping from its authority. Images and objects from Asia and Africa enriched the visual repertoire. Boundaries were tested and breached. Freed from the obligation to depict anything real, paintings took on a life of their own. And these astonishing moments of creativity would have been unthinkable without the diversity of the cultures on this continent and the cultural competition between them. It would be difficult to underestimate the spiritual effect these caves had on the people of that era. We're now fairly certain that some caves were used specifically for rituals. Humans already lived in groups at this point, and they divided up their work among themselves. It's easy to imagine that during the winter, when the opportunities for hunting and gathering were limited, they would have honed their cultural skills. And that's how we get the Lion Man, carved from a mammoth tusk 35,000 years ago. Half man, half lion, perhaps even a demigod. It began in caves, but soon spread into the world beyond. The first outdoor venues of collective worship sprang up in multiple locations across Europe around 5,000 years ago. The first settled peoples positioned enormous boulders in circles, creating sites like Stonehenge. They were aligned with the course of the sun and primarily served as observatories. Transporting and setting up the stones must have been an incredibly challenging task for the people of that era. They had to be highly organized and must have developed specialized skills and technologies for the job. Ancestor worship played an important role here. They wanted to immortalize the world of their forebears in stone for all eternity. Cults and strictly defined rituals seem to have been the glue that held these early societies together. Of course, we need to see this in perspective. While the Europeans were positioning boulders, the Egyptians were building pyramids. Stone monuments sprang up from Spain to Sweden and Poland to France. For the first time, these megaliths mark a visible commonality among the various peoples of Europe. But at the same time, the first cities are already appearing in modern-day Iraq and Syria. Europe is still a developing country. In the Eastern Mediterranean, on the other hand, things are starting to get interesting. Myths and legends are being woven. Why is Europe called Europe? Well, the answer lies here in Greece. A myth relates that Zeus, father of the gods, fell in love with beautiful Europa, daughter of the Phoenician king of Sidon in today's Lebanon. Europa immediately fell in love with the bull, or rather Zeus, and climbed onto his back. Together, they swam to Crete. There, the bull took human form and asked the beautiful maiden to be his queen. The part of the world where she lived would forever bear her name. It's a myth, of course, but like all myths, it contains a kernel of truth, because the origins of Europe really did lie outside this continent, in Asia Minor, the Levant, and Africa. From the very beginning, Europe was a place where cultures met and mixed, and this would be one of the keys to its power and creativity. It all started on Crete. The islanders were gifted seafarers and traders. Crete became Europe's first commercial power. 
crafting an impressive trade network that stretched across the entire Mediterranean to Egypt and Mesopotamia. The Cretans grew olives and exported the valuable oil to places like Egypt. King Minos, who according to legend was the son of Zeus and Europa, commissioned the construction of a magnificent palace in Knossos over 3,000 years ago. Today it still bears witness to the golden age of both the island and the Minoans, the first advanced civilization in Europe. Europe's first kingdom emerges here, but there are many indications that the Minoans aren't particularly interested in personally exercising power. From everything we know about this mysterious culture, it appears that leaders and heroes didn't play an especially eminent role. The first European laws and courts have their roots in Minoan society. Their legal codes governed everything from family law to criminal law, literally letter by letter. The Minoans were the first Europeans who could read and write. They adopted their writing system from the Phoenicians. This Middle Eastern alphabet is the mother of all European writing systems. The Minoans even stamped these symbols in clay on the famous Phaistos disc, nearly 3,000 years before Johannes Gutenberg invented modern printing. The meaning of the ancient symbols may have been forgotten over time, but the Greeks ultimately based their own alphabet on the Minoan writing system, and both our Latin alphabet and the Cyrillic Eastern European alphabet have their origins in Greek. For centuries to come, Europe's path would be shaped by the legacy of ancient Greece. What was so special about Greece? Well, partly it was a question of geography. The Greeks were scattered in some 1,500 cities, the Poleis, around the shores of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Black Sea. The terrain of the Greek mainland, crisscrossed by mountains and ravines, favored small communities, but also obliged them to trade and negotiate with each other. Not all of the cities were democracies. Some were ruled by oligarchs or by tyrants. But one city established a system of government that would leave a deep imprint on world history. Nothing compares to Athens in its golden age. Many of the traits that define modern Europe can be found here. The Greeks' world consists of numerous gods to whom they dedicate the temples they build, but also of brilliant thinkers who spend their days investigating earthly concerns. The grand Parthenon temple on the Acropolis is the most beautiful representation of what the streets and squares of ancient Athens brought forth into the world. Architecture, science, philosophy, art, literature, and also political thought. Athens isn't ruled by a king, but by the people. For the first time in the continent's history, all men share responsibility for the decisions that affect everyone. Women don't yet play a political role, but it's a start. Democracy is born. Calm down! All opposed to the proposal, raise your hands. And all in favor, raise your hand now. Perhaps we could learn a thing or two from the ancient Athenians. They used a voting machine known as a clerotarion to fill political offices. Men were elected by lottery, so there was no opportunity for corruption or for lobbying. Leonidas Linos, you are elected. But all of this didn't happen overnight. Democracy in Athens developed slowly, step by step, and it was repeatedly reformed. The Athenian democracy possessed three institutions that remain crucial to the political organization of any free society. A basic law or constitution dating back to the fifth century BC, a parliament, the ecclesia, where matters of state were discussed by the citizenry, and a system of independent courts. And these performed their tasks in magnificent public buildings located at the heart of the city. The climate must have helped, because a lot of the public life of this culture took place outdoors. The Athenian democracy was not invincible, 
just two centuries after its inception, it was terminated by the rising power of the Macedonian kingdom. But the fact that the democracy of Athens ultimately failed to hold out against a military dictatorship does nothing to diminish its world historical importance. What was it Winston Churchill told the British Parliament? Democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. In that sense, it's easy to understand why Greek architecture is still reflected in so many parliament buildings in Europe today. Symbols representing the power of the people, even if the Athenian form of government has little in common with our modern representative democracy. This is where things come full circle. The idea of democracy, the balance of power, is supposed to be reflected in the golden ratio of the buildings. It all traces back to the Greeks' pursuit of perfection. Democracy would later become one of the founding principles of modern Europe and the cornerstone of this community of nations. Of course, we shouldn't idealize Athenian democracy. Only free male Athenians held citizenship. Women and slaves had no political rights at all. And this democracy, like all democracies, was an untidy and open-ended affair. The nobility were always trying to expand their privileges and even on occasion to overturn the system. The power of money was another problem. When the wealthiest citizens used their cash to secure power, plutocracy loomed. And then there was the power of the public word. Demagogues, the literal translation means leader of the people, was the name the Greeks gave to those gifted orators who sought to sway the masses in their decisions. This didn't have to be a bad thing. When demagogues placed themselves in the service of the political system, they could do great good. But as soon as they placed their own interests or those of a particular faction above those of the city, they became a threat to the general good. And today, in an ever more complex world, the demagogues are prospering once again in Europe. The marathon is the most democratic sporting event of all time. Young, old, fat, thin, anyone can join in the run. Millions of people around the world catch marathon fever every year. This long distance run is named after a small town in Greece. The first marathon runner of history was completely alone. His name was Philippides, and he ran the approximately 40 kilometers from the town of Marathon to the marketplace in Athens in order to announce the victory of the Greeks over a much larger Persian army in a decisive battle. It's said that he then collapsed dead on the ground, but not before warning the Athenians that the remaining Persian forces were swiftly approaching the city. And so, 490 years before the Christian era, Athenian soldiers move into position. Here's the story. The global superpower of the time, the expansive Persian Empire, feels threatened by the rival cities of Corinth, Sparta, and Athens. The Greeks are united by this common enemy, and they react together with a preemptive strike. For the first time, they feel like Europeans, and they even call their homeland Europe. It is an identity born of a shared fate. Athens defeats the Persians. The war continues, but the future of the continent is decided in the dust of Marathon. The victory at Marathon was a defining moment for the Greek democracy, a sign of what could be achieved through unity and self-confidence. Then, as so often in its history, the destiny of democracy was tied up with war. Above all, the victory at Marathon showed that deeper popular participation in political life can actually heighten the striking power of a state. And the gods, too, were granted their share. In its gratitude for the victory, the city sacrificed 500 goats every year until the number of slaughtered goats matched the number of Persian dead. The story of that victory is classic Hollywood blockbuster material. Back then, it was immediately adapted for the stage. That's right, Athens is also the birthplace of the entertainment industry. 
The Greeks have loved heroic tales since the days of Homer, and the story of the Persian Wars is no exception. Actors step into the role of their old enemy and relive a victory that all Greeks are proud of. Be stern and remember, chin up and chest out. Aeschylus, a veteran of well the Battle done. of Marathon, well is the author of this thrilling work. It's your turn now. With support from the young politician Pericles, the playwright hopes to win the theatre competition that the Athenians hold every year in honour of Dionysus, the god of wine and mirth. Aeschylus himself hadn't exactly covered himself in glory on the battlefield, but this play would immortalise his name. The playwright portrays the senselessness of war, which leads to nothing but horror, despair, death and grief. He tells the story from the perspective of the losing side, without denigrating the Persians for their loss. In this way, he hopes to educate his audience. And the Athenians understand his message. The Persians won first prize. It's the oldest surviving theatrical work in the world. From tragedy to comedy, the Greeks showed the world the meaning of good entertainment. The narrative forms established then have survived the test of time, and the play commemorating the event that gave rise to the idea of Europe, the Persian Wars, is still regularly performed on stage even today. Art, architecture, political thought, society in ancient Greece was open and sophisticated, and over the centuries, Europe has drawn again and again from this cultural wellspring. So this is where the roots of our European civilization lie, but outside of Hellas, no one else yet identified themselves as European. So how did the ancient Greeks disseminate their culture? And how did Greek culture become European culture? In the fourth century before the birth of Christ, Macedonian King Alexander, later known as Alexander the Great, conquers all the Greek city-states with the exception of Sparta. He wants to spread Greek culture around the world. He creates a global empire in Asia, which he feels is more promising terrain than the European continent. The Greeks, on the other hand, established colonies around the Mediterranean, including Massalia, today known as Marseille. This is where explorer Pythias sets sail in the fourth century before Christ. A contemporary of Alexander the Great, Pythias wants to explore northern Europe, and his discoveries will revolutionize the Greeks' view of the world. Up to that point, they had believed that the best and most intelligent people could only be found in the Mediterranean. Then Pythias met the Celts, and a new power appeared on the scene. The Celts are not a unified people, and they don't have an empire. Instead, they live in numerous different tribal groups, but they have shared customs, and when they feel threatened, they close ranks. That sounds almost European, you might say. And in fact, in the first century BC, the Celts expand their tribal territory from Central Europe to Anatolia and Britannia. Their culture continues to grow and develop. The North is full of nothing but backward barbarians, the Greeks think. They believe that the cold and fog of the North has made the people sluggish. Still, they give the Northerners a flattering name, the Celts or the brave ones. The Greeks are also interested in doing business. They have olives and wine to trade with the Celts for amber and tin. But first, they need to introduce the Celts to Greek culture. A few gifts, mainly gold, help to solidify their friendship. Pythias, the explorer from Marseille, knows how important this is. He was the first Greek to reach the northern edge of the known world at the time. The Celts are more than just strong warriors. They're also gifted metal workers, and slowly they develop a taste for the Mediterranean lifestyle, especially for wine. This vessel, as tall as an adult, came from Greece and was found in the tomb of a Celtic chieftainess. The ubiquitous drinking horns are further evidence of the Celts' unquenchable thirst. The Celts were the ones who built the first cities north of the Alps, around 150 of them, in fact. One of the most famous is the Heuneburg, located in modern-day southern Germany. 
It's the oldest known Celtic settlement north of the Alps to be mentioned in literature. Even Greek historian Herodotus was interested in this city. Built in 600 BC, the Hoyneburg was the residence of Celtic chieftains with clever fortifications to fend off enemies. The Celts carefully organized their lives behind the high walls. They had their own coins and a system for the division of labor. Up to 10,000 people lived in this form of ancient city. From here, the Celts increasingly traded with the Greeks and with Pythias's hometown, Marseille. The Celts weren't exactly methodical when it came to occupation and conquest, but in 387 BC, they briefly conquered Rome, a traumatic experience that remained a vivid memory for the city's ensuing generations. The Imperium Romanum, the Roman Empire isn't an exact model for our modern concept of Europe, of course, but today's Europe certainly has many of its roots in Rome. The idea of the Republic, the laws, the architecture, in many areas the Romans were able to build on what the Greeks had created. The Pantheon is a good example here. Behind the Greek-style facade is one of the oldest and largest domes in Europe, and it's made of cement. Both of those things, Roman inventions. In all areas of life, the Romans looked to the Greeks for inspiration, but they wanted to improve on things as well. The ambitious Gaius Julius Caesar is no exception. He sees a bright future for himself. He dreams of being a conqueror like Alexander the Great. But before he can make history, he has to tread the career path of a Roman civil servant, a long, hard slog. He spares no expense or effort in pursuit of his ambitions, spending enormous sums on bribes. And by the time he becomes consul, Caesar has racked up considerable debts. What he needs now is a war, a campaign of plunder to burnish his reputation and fill his empty coffers. But Caesar has a problem. There's not much left to plunder. His predecessors have already quashed competition around the Mediterranean. His only remaining option is the wild north of Europe, the land of the Celts, or the Gauls, as the Romans call them. Caesar plans to show these barbarians who's boss, 300 years after the Celts themselves had plundered Rome. Better late than never. Which brings us to the bane of every Latin student's existence, the Commentarii de Bello Gallico, or Caesar's account of the Gallic Wars. In the region today known as France, Celtic chieftain Vercingetorix attempts to block the path of Caesar's legions, barricading himself into the city of Alesia. Caesar and 50,000 of his legionaries surround the city with two layers of circular fortifications secured with guard towers, moats, and traps. Caesar describes the brutality of this war without betraying a hint of emotion. Vercingetorix sends all the women, children, and elderly out of the city, but they are trapped by the Roman fortifications. Caesar refuses to help them. The war remains closed. Then Vercingetorix attacks. The battle lasts four days. More than once, the Gauls are close to surmounting the Roman walls, but they are beaten back and suffer major losses each time. Finally, the Roman commander himself takes to the front lines of his cavalry, bolstering the wavering ranks of his legionaries. They capture such a large number of prisoners that each legionary receives one as a slave. After six years of fighting, Vercingetorix surrenders. His people, the Gauls, are absorbed into the Roman Empire. With this victory, Caesar successfully expands the Roman Empire far into the west.
in the 19th century, the Gaulish Versingetorix becomes French. In modern France, he is still considered a national hero deserving of a monument as a symbol of their unity as a nation. The world of the Celts shrinks after the Battle of Alesia. First, they disappear north of the Alps, and then Caesar conquers Gaul and incorporates it into the Roman Empire. In the end, only the Celts on the British Isles remain. Caesar's path is drenched in blood. By his own account, he had over one million lives on his conscience. Look behind you and remember that you are but a man. This good advice is drowned out by the cheers of the masses. With the praise heaped upon Caesar, he rises to the status of demigod, and he knows it. Megalomania becomes his constant companion. After his victory over the Gauls, Caesar calls for a victory parade the likes of which have never been seen before. It's an unparalleled show of strength. He dresses as Jupiter, the chief deity in the Roman pantheon. No false modesty here. And Caesar presents his most important trophy, Vercingetorix. He keeps him alive just for this performance. Caesar, conqueror of the barbarians, the message comes across loud and clear. With Caesar, a new idea takes hold in Europe, the concept of empire. Rome had been a republic up to that point, ruled by the nobility. But the senators transfer full control to Caesar, naming him dictator for life. The Roman Republic becomes the Imperium Romanum, incorporating broad swathes of Europe so, ironically, Europeans have one of the world's greatest egomaniacs to thank for the first political union. European emperors and dictators invoke Caesar's name from Roman times up until the 20th century. His successors, the Caesars, became Kaisers and Tsars, Charlemagne, Ivan the Terrible, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor Wilhelm II, and Benito Mussolini. Caesar's adopted son and heir, Augustus, is the first to truly and firmly establish the idea of empire, and it's under his rule that people become aware of what it means to govern a continent. And this included perfect communication with his subjects across Europe. Augustus, who built this forum, was a master of public relations. He really understood the marketing of power. And here, as you can see, he's depicted on a coin. This is how, for the first time in European history, the image of a ruler traveled a million times over. Augustus preempted Andy Warhol's 20th century axiom, expose yourself, take your picture, big yourself up, and send your image around the world. Facebook, Instagram, nothing new there then. As his power increased, Augustus' picture changed. At the beginning, his face was still folded in the worry lines of a politician preoccupied by the res publica, the affairs of state. Later, the lines fell away. The face depicted in pictures and on coins is completely smooth, timeless, and godlike. The image minted here was meticulously designed and thought through by Augustus and his spin doctors. And the message was, you can be proud, Romans, that you reign over the world. This is your calling. The comforts offered by the Roman way of civilization are one of the primary factors driving the success of Greco-Roman civilization. The Romans established colonies everywhere, from southern France and Trier in Germany to Bath in Britain, from the Atlantic to the Balkans. And the dense network of roads they construct in the lands they conquer make it easy for legionaries, traders and travelers to cross the continent. Roman roads crisscross thousands of kilometers throughout Europe. The Romans organize an entire continent. 
They connect Europe with their empire and their language, and they unite Europe with their laws. Soon, Roman law would apply everywhere in Europe, governing the daily lives of its peoples and stipulating the means of resolving all disputes. The Romans have a criminal law and a defined code of criminal procedure, which would form the basis for everything that came afterwards. Roman citizenship in particular had a tremendous power to integrate. It was granted to all inhabitants of the Roman Empire in the year 212. Slaves were the only exception. Emperor Caracalla ensured that there was equality before the law, and he also looked to the pleasure of the Romans, ordering that the system of aqueducts be extended and that gigantic thermal baths be built. Whether dressed for the public baths or standing before a court of law, everyone was equal and possessed in principle at least, the same opportunities for advancement. Theoretically, anyone could assume public office, and the Romans never forced a citizen to give up his own culture. Many of those who fell under Rome's sway wanted in any case to be like the Romans, and so voluntarily assimilated themselves to the Roman norm. And so the Pax Romana came about, internal peace in this huge empire, and with it, a loose community that one might describe as proto-European. But not all Europeans are prepared to trade their freedom for a bath at a Roman spa. The peoples of the regions today known as Germany and Scotland offer stubborn, assertive resistance. Rather than subduing the ruly barbarians, the Romans seal themselves off. With Hadrian's Wall today on the border between England and Scotland, it was named for the Roman emperor who commissioned its construction. They also set up a border defense system against the Germanic tribes along the Rhine and Danube rivers, the Limes, a 550 kilometer cultural border that cuts right through Europe. On one side are the cities of the Roman Empire where civilization flourishes. There are magnificent buildings here, spas and bustling marketplaces. When Augustus reigned, many millions of people lived in these cities. Germania, which is not occupied by the Romans, is thinly populated. It looks a bit like a gigantic nature reserve. East of the Rhine live numerous Germanic and Slavic tribes in far-flung villages. It's a completely different world, an archaic world. A handful of travel reports full of stories about the barbarians to the north were circulating in Rome. They were likely the basis for the work of Publius Cornelius Tacitus, whose most famous publication bears the succinct title, Germania. The senator and historian apparently never traveled to the wild north of Europe himself, but that didn't stop him from writing 46 chapters about these backward barbarian tribes in the year 98 AD. He describes them as slovenly dressers, and he makes mention of their simple foods and their unusually intoxicating drink, something called beer, which was unknown in Rome at the time. Tacitus praises the hospitality of the Germanic tribes, their modesty and their bravery, but in fact his aim is to hold a mirror up to Roman society. He's particularly impressed with the marital fidelity of the northerners, but he also mentions their tendency to drink to excess and to gamble on games of dice. Of course, what else can they be expected to do in such barren, wooded country, Tacitus wonders. He puts all these musings to paper as he continues to marvel at these exotic Teutons. There is brisk trade between the Romans and the Germanic tribes in the border regions via gates in the Limes. On the whole, the European neighbors seem to have come to an arrangement only occasionally do the Numeri, a Roman rapid response force, need to step in. Like border police, they take action against the frequent raids plotted by Germanic hordes against the wealthy Romans on the other side of the wall. But walls and fences aren't a permanent solution, and the Romans learned that the hard way. When nomadic Asian tribes invade Europe in the fourth century, the old order crumbles. 
Roman officer and historian Amianos Marcelinus describes the arrival of the Hun peoples, saying that they were excited by an unrestrained desire of plundering the possessions of others, and that they went on ravishing and slaughtering all the nations in their neighborhood. After more than 300 years, the Pax Romana, the peace within the Roman Empire, comes to an end. Germanic tribes descend on the empire as refugees and as conquerors. The Goths are the first to seek refuge in the empire. They cross the Danube in 376. Other Germanic tribes would follow. Amianos Marcelinos observes this mass migration and reports on large numbers of unfamiliar barbarian tribes composed of various nations, now with all their families wandering about in different directions on the banks of the river Danube. At first, this intelligence was lightly treated by our people, he writes. And in fact, the Romans gradually lose control, first over their borders and then over their empire. The empire is finally divided in the year 395 into a Western and an Eastern Roman Empire. This migration period upsets the balance of ancient Europe, but at the same time, Europe as we know it begins to take shape. Germanic kingdoms arise in the territory of Western Rome, including the powerful Franconia in the region that is today Germany and France. I've traveled to the Angles and Saxons in England, or to be more specific, to Cambridge. Europe has always been about movement. Peoples and nations came and went, everything got mixed up. And the record of this long history of more or less constant movement over thousands of years is recorded in the genetic material of the Europeans. And with the modern methods of gene technology, we can read it every individual can find out what kind of a mix he or she is made up of. And that's interesting. I, for example, would very much like to know how much of Europe is inside me as an Australian and what paths my ancestors followed on the old continent. With some patience and a little bit of saliva, I can find it out. I'm going to send this sample to a laboratory in the United States. My genetic material will be deciphered and I'm looking forward to getting the result. By the way, all of this is only possible because Francis Crick and James Watson discovered here in Cambridge how our genetic material is constructed. And it was in this pub that they first informed the public of their discoveries in 1953. Pop this into the post box. Let's see what they say. I'm eagerly awaiting my results, and two weeks later, they arrive. Ah, the results of my gene test are in. And here we have it. 78.5% of me is British or Irish, that's hardly surprising. At least 5.1% is French or German. Apparently you can't distinguish between French and German genes. 2.5% is Scandinavian, and 11% of my genes come from the North European and Baltic Sea region. That must be the Viking in me. But I'm also 0.7% Sardinian. I'm particularly proud of that element of my genetic heritage. And then there are the Neanderthal genes, which apparently we all have, and the DNA from North Africa, apparently that too is universal, and from the Middle East all the result of migratory movement to and within Europe. History has been mixing Europe together since the Stone Age, and even I, as an Australian, am part of that story. It's this extraordinary diversity, this blend of languages and cultures, that has always triggered movement in Europe, just as it did in the Roman era when the Imperium Romanum collapsed. It was a gradual process, the supposed decadence of late Roman culture wasn't the only thing that led to its downfall. 
What does an empire look like as it disintegrates? The continuous civil war and declining economy of Western Rome means that that part of the empire has essentially already dissolved. Child Emperor Romulus Augustulus sits on the imperial throne. The influence of the Germanic tribes has grown significantly. Now they seize complete control of Western Europe. The story of the Roman Empire in the West ends after 503 years with the dethronement of the child emperor by Germanic leader Odoacer in the year 476. Take the imperial mantle to Byzantium. Tell the emperor of East Rome that we no longer need it. Not here. From now on, I'll have a new title. Rex Italiae, King of Italy. This fountain in the middle of Rome, right in front of the Pantheon, tells a typically European story. The Roman emperors loved obelisks because, as the ancient Egyptians already knew, obelisks are a kind of antenna to the gods. So they caused them, this one, for example, dates from the time of Ramses II, to be brought to the Eternal City. A thousand years later, Pope Clement XI had it erected here and added another antenna in the form of a cross on top. And here you can see his coat of arms. The dolphins were added later during the Baroque and represent Christ, the redeemer of souls. And then there's the water in the fountain itself. The worship of river gods and spring nymphs was, of course, a widespread practice among the Greeks. And for Plato, the philosopher, water always performed an allegorical function. Plato compared the ideal state to a body of clear waters into which all springs and brooks flow and merge. And one could compare this fountain with Europe itself. What was there in its past is constantly mingling with something new. From this dynamic mixture, great things can grow. So, what remains? For me, Rome's most beautiful building is the Pantheon with its massive dome. It's a place that reflects the highs and lows of European history like no other. I want to go back there one more time. The resonance of this place conveys something of its immensity. This really is a breathtaking temple. When Michelangelo first clapped eyes on the Pantheon in Rome, he thought that such an architectural wonder could scarcely have been created by mortal hands, but must have been the work of angels. And perhaps he was right, because that would explain why the Pantheon survived the devastating destructions of the Teutons in Rome, as well as a couple of earthquakes. At any rate, the seizure of power by the Teutons turned out not to be the end of European history. On the contrary, it further enriched the unique mix on whose foundations European civilization rests until this day. Because instead of destroying the ancient culture of the Greeks and Romans, the Germanic warriors cultivated this legacy. A further ingredient was still to come, Christianity. What will bind the Europeans together, but also bitterly divide them, is their faith.